discussion between Brahma and the Supreme Personality of Godhead. We just have to do more quotations, what I display on the screen. Yeah. The impersonalist adduces no activity in the Supreme, but in this discussion between Brahma and the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Lord is said to have activities also, as He has His form and quality. The activities of Brahma and other demigods during the maintenance of the creation are to be understood as the activities of the Lord. The king or the head executive of a state may not be seen in the government offices 
for or even be engaged in royal comforts. Yet, it should be understood that everything is being done under his direction and everything is at his command. The personality of Godhead is never formless. In the material world, he may not be visible in his personal form to the less intelligent class of men, and therefore he may sometimes be called formless. But actually, he is always in his eternal form and his vibrant planets, as well as in other planets of the universes as different incarnations. The example of the sun is very appropriate in this connection. The sun in the night may not be visible to the eyes of men in the darkness, but the sun is visible when it has risen. That the sun is not visible to the eyes of the inhabitants of the particular place, particular part of the earth, does not mean that the sun has no form. So this is the sixth paragraph. I'll stop here and we'll discuss this portion. Oma Jnana Timirandasya Jnana Dimishana Paya Chakshurum Nilitam Yena Tasman Shri Gurave Namaha Namao Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nitinamini Namaste Saraswate Deve Kauravani Pacharini Nirvishesha Shunyavani Paschakya Deshitarini Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Shri Vasadi Gauravakta Vrindya Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So this whole discussion will be about the difference between the personal feature of the absolute truth, the personality of God, and the impersonal feature. So you always keep in the back of your mind when we are hearing, going through this discussion, that the Lord or the absolute truth has got both these aspects. He has a personality and he has got impersonal feature also. Whereas the Mayavadis deny the person, the Vaishnavas don't deny the impersonal aspect. It is very important to remember. The Vaishnavas don't deny the impersonal feature. Impersonal feature is there. But, the Mayavadis say, God is impersonal. There is no personality. So that is not correct. God has got impersonal feature and He has also got spiritual personality. But, the personal feature is more important and fundamental than the impersonal feature. Why is it so? Why is personal feature more important? Because as soon as we understand the personal feature, then we can also understand person means activities, person means form, person means qualities, person means relationship, person means paraphernalia, person means abode, person means opulence, person means renunciation. So many things open up when you immediately, when you, as soon as you say God is a person, So many things happen. All these are absent when you consider the impersonal feature of God. Impersonal feature, no form, no activity, no qualities. So, their description of impersonal feature, Nirakar, no form. Nirguna, no qualities. Nirvishesha, no varieties. So, 
like this they have gone describing negative way impersonal feature of the absolute truth and they will keep on denying all descriptions in the Bhagavatam about Krishna's activities, Krishna's form, Krishna's name, Krishna's qualities, Krishna's paraphernalia, Krishna's abode, Krishna's devotees, Krishna's relationship, everything they deny. So that's why Prabhupada begins this paragraph with this sentence. The impersonalist adduces no activity in the Supreme, but in this discussion between Brahma and the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Lord is said to have activities also, as he has his form and quality. Now, where is this mention of activity? That is mentioned here that before the creation, the Lord was existing. Then the creation took place. So if God was existing before the creation and the creation has taken place and after that only Brahma is born and everything has come to existence. So who is the creator? It is God. It is the person. So therefore, it is said here, in this discussion between Brahma and the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Lord is said to have activities also. He is creating. Then, regarding maintenance, somebody may say, Oh, maintenance is done by the Devatas. But Prabhupada explains here very nicely, a king may not be seen in different places in the kingdom. But whatever activities are going on in the different places in the kingdom, all the people are working under the direction of the king according to his command, according to his order, according to his organization. So he need not personally go and do so much work to assert his authority. Simply he gives command, that's all. There are people to carry it out. In that same spirit, you see, even now, if any government department has to order some material, they will say, on behalf of the President of India, this is central government undertaking, on behalf of the President of India, we hereby invite tender for purchase of so-and-so material. They do it on behalf of the President of India. Because he is the executive head of state of the whole country. So under his direction, only everything is going on. Similarly, Krishna or Vishnu cannot be seen in this material world. Devatas are carrying out different activities, but they are doing it on behalf of Krishna or on behalf of Vishnu. So maintenance is also being done by Vishnu only. Because the Devatas who are actually doing some actual work, they are also acting under the direction of the Supreme Lord Vishnu. So maintenance is also being done by Vishnu. And of course, destruction is only possible to be done by Vishnu. Because other than Vishnu, everything is destroyed. So only he remains after everything is destroyed. Yoga shisheta sosmeham. After destruction, what remains is also I, the personality of God, and only Vishnu remains. So who is doing the destruction? Naturally it's Vishnu. Somebody may say, no, no, Shiva is the destroyer. But Shiva does the destruction on behalf of Vishnu. 
Shiva does the destruction on behalf of Vishnu. And Shiva himself will not remain after the destruction is over. Shiva himself will not remain. So who remains after the destruction? Vishnu. So who is the destroyer? Vishnu. So that's why we have to understand that Vishnu exists through all the three stages of this material change in this world. Creation, maintenance, destruction. And it is Vishnu only who creates through Brahma and who destroys through Shiva and who maintains through all the demigods headed by Brahma and Shiva. He need not personally do anything because he is the Lord. He is the Lord. He need not personally do. When the Shastras say he is the creator, you don't have to look for what creation is he doing. He did not do any creation. He can have his subordinates, his assistants, his energies, his, uh, his uh, servants working for him. Why he has to do anything? He did not do it. He's the Lord. And the example of the sun is very nicely given. At night you cannot see the sun. Now, just because you cannot see the sun, you can't say the sun doesn't exist. Then somebody said, oh, sun is there, but it is without any light, it is without any heat, it is without any glare. Sun is there. No, you cannot say because you cannot see the sun or you don't feel the heat or the sunshine, you cannot say the sun doesn't have any heat, sun doesn't have any light. It is just that the sun is not visible to the eyes of the inhabitants of a particular part of the earth. Similarly, Vishnu is not visible, is not visible to the inhabitants of this material world. But he is eternally present in the Vaikuntha Loka with all his power, with all his paraphernalia, with all his glory, with the devotees, who can clearly see him, who can perceive him, who can interact with him. So just like the sun may not be visible at night here, but you go to another part of the earth, let's say United States of America, there the sun is shining brightly, sun is very much visible, sun is there. So the example of the sun is appropriate example to understand that Vishnu may not be visible in this world, but he is definitely visible and is active and is seen with all his occurrences in the Bhagavad So that is the description here that Vishnu is present even though he may not be visible, but where is he present? He is present in the Vaikuntha Loka. Now this Vaikuntha Loka is not accessible to everyone in this world. Generally it is inaccessible for people of this world. But if anybody adopts the process of bhakti, then that Vaikuntha Loka becomes known. You can know about Vaikuntha Loka. You can travel to Vaikuntha Loka. And there are instances in the Bhagavata. There is one great uh, Muni, Durvasa Muni, very powerful yogi. So he travelled to Vaikuntha. Of course, using his mystic power, he was able to do that. <clears throat> but if we cannot go or we cannot see, we simply cannot deny. And it is not true that this Vaikuntha Loka is some description only in some uh, Vaishnava literature. This is what the Mayavadi say. The Vaikuntha Loka is described in the Vedic literature. It described. But 
the details may not be there in the vedas because it is confidential knowledge confidential knowledge means everything is not revealed directly uh, it's not directly revealed that's why confidential so it has to be uh, understood that there is vaikuntha loka it is described in the scriptures and the details are not available so readily in the vedic uh, literature but there are scriptures where the details are also dis- described or available this is like the brahma samhita so many details of krishna's personal abode is available but those many details will not be available in other literature but still the other literature describe krishna's personal abode whether the vedas or the upanishads or the vedanta sutra or the bhagavad gita or the bhagavatam puranas itihasas uh, samhitas everywhere the lord is described in his personal feature his form his qualities his activities are described so one of the important contributions of chaitanya mahaprabhu's disciples called the six goswamis of vrindavan shat goswami one of the important contributions they have done is also described in the glorification of the six goswamis nana shastra vichara naik nipuna sad dharma samsthapako they have compiled many books after studying all the vedic literatures scrutinizingly they have written so many books in order to establish the real religious principles in human society sad dharma samsthapako so what are they done one of the important contributions of the goswamis is that they have given shruti pramana for so many statements of the smriti smriti and shruti are two categories of vedic literature shruti means that which is coming down by hearing since the beginning of creation the vedic literature that is coming down by the oral tradition is shruti after the creation has taken place many great sages saintly persons devotees have further elaborated on the shruti and given us the smriti literature so smriti is compiled or written by great realized souls saintly persons authorities in vedic literature and that is also equally valid or authoritative but the mayavadi class of philosophers they don't accept smriti they accept only shruti they say they say vedas in shruti because shruti is not written or compiled by any human being or any created being so we have to listen smruti it is written by somebody or compiled by somebody we don't accept that so that's not a valid argument or a justification for rejecting smruti still the goswamis have taken the statements of the smruti the puranas the itihasas and they have given references from shruti to support the descriptions in the smriti for example in the bhagavatam there is description of krishna's personal abode golok vrindavan now where is golok vrindavan mentioned or described or there is any reference in the shruti that is given by the goswami yes it is available 
In the Shruti, all references are available for whatever is described in the Smriti. Only thing in the Smriti, the details are given, elaborations are given. Whereas in the Shruti, the details may not be there. So this work is done by the six Goswami of Vrindavan. So one cannot say that whatever is there in the Smriti is totally absent in the Shruti. Nobody can say that. Because it's hard work. It's not all available in one place. They say Rupa Goswami has written Bhakti Rasamrata Sindhu. It describes everything about Bhakti Yoga. Now, if you ask, is there any reference to Bhakti Yoga or practice of Bhakti Yoga or principles of Bhakti Yoga in the Shruti? The answer is yes, it is there in the Shruti. But it is scattered over so many different places. So what has Rupa Goswami done? He has gathered all those references and brought them together in one book. Bhakti Rasamrata Narada Muni has compiled one important work, book for Bhakti, followers of Bhakti, Narada Bhakti Sutra. So what has Narada Muni done? He has gathered all the references from the Shruti about Bhakti and given them in one place, Narada Bhakti Sutra. So like that, the works of the Acharyas, great devotees, or great saintly persons, or great sages, or great rishis, is not to create something new, but to gather, compile, bring together all the different descriptions or explanations given in so many different places in the Shruti, to bring them together in one place. So this is the work of the Acharyas, like Veda Vyasa. Now he put the Vedas in writing, foreseeing that in Kali Yuga people will not have sufficient memory or intelligence to actually uh, study the Vedas simply through hearing. So he put it in writing. Now when he is putting in writing, it is so voluminous that there are also a need to divide the one Veda into four parts. So he divided the one Veda. Then even one fourth of what was divided is quite big. So then he further summarized into Vedanta to give the philosophy of the Vedic text. He presented the philosophy in the form of Upanishads or Vedanta. Now, so many different Upanishads based on which text was used to uh, gather the philosophy portion. Then he further brought all that philosophy into one book, Vedanta Sutra. All the philosophy of the different Upanishads he brought into one book. So, like this, the great sages, saintly persons, they are not giving or concocting or creating anything new when they are writing books or compiling some literature. They are giving the same message, same teachings, same philosophy, which is already there in the Vedas. They are not giving anything new. Even Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna, I spoke this Bhagavad Gita millions of years back to the Sun God. And the same thing I am now going to speak to you. You see, Krishna is the ultimate authority. But even he is telling, I am speaking the same thing which I have already spoken. So if you ask, what did he tell the sun god? <coughs> the 
the same thing which was imparted to Brahma at the beginning of his creation. So, in the Mayavadi say, we only accept Shruti. That Shruti is nothing but what Krishna instructed Brahma at the beginning of creation. So, the same thing is coming down in Parampara, in oral tradition. Same thing Krishna is instructing Sun God, same thing Krishna is instructing Brahma, same thing Krishna is instructing to, uh, giving instructions to Arjuna, same thing the Acharyas are presenting in the different compilations. So nothing is new, nothing is created, so to speak, as far as the Vedic literature is concerned, the Smriti is concerned. They are all the same message, the same uh, philosophy, but at different times, according to the requirement, different compilations have been done. It is said that in Kali Yuga, people's intelligence is not as much as it was in the previous ages. Memory power reduces in Kali Yuga, intelligence reduces. Uh, Duration of life reduces. So many handicaps are there in Kali Yuga. So for such a population, something has to be done. So that is the work of these great sages before the Kali Yuga began. So nothing new, but something suitable for the time, place, circumstances. That is what the Acharyas present. Now Prabhupada, has written all these Bhakti Vedanta purports, translated the scriptures into English. Now the same thing what is given by the Acharyas in some other language, Prabhupada is putting it in English. He is not creating something new. Whatever he is explaining is there in some other language, Sanskrit or Bengali, rarely Bengali, it is mostly Sanskrit. We cannot read and understand Sanskrit. That is our position today. And anyway, Sanskrit scholarship is not the way to study the scriptures. That is also there. It has to be explained by the Acharya. So Prabhupada is explaining in a language we can understand. So he is present in English. So from both perspectives, Prabhupada has to write the book and we have to read this book and understand. So he is explaining in a way we can understand and he is explaining in a language which we can easily follow. So Prabhupada is not giving anything new. In the beginning of Chaitanya Charita Amrita, in the introduction, preface, Prabhupada is writing, there is nothing new to be presented as regards Chaitanya Charita Amrita is concerned. Simply, we are presenting what is already spoken, what is already explained by the previous Acharyas. So, the message, the, the, the philosophy, the understanding is one. There is no scope for somebody to concoct or create something new, something different. There is no need of interpretation. So this is the sacred parampara understanding. And if somebody follows the process of bhakti, then this method of receiving through the descending process also becomes very clear. Like so many things we cannot conceive or we cannot perceive or we cannot experience directly, we accept the scriptural authority, the explanation of the Acharyas and we try to progress in our understanding of what is the absolute truth. So if we cannot see Krishna, we can hear about Krishna or we can read about Krishna. We can get descriptions of Krishna's form or Krishna's activities or Krishna's qualities. 
from the acharyas, from the scriptures, from the writings of the previous sages, and we can accept that and proceed or progress in spiritual life. It's for our benefit, it's for our advantage. And it is not that this will remain some kind of inconceivable thing. No. Everything that is said here, you can realize firsthand when you actually make progress in bhakti, you can see Krishna face to face. Prabhupada, you can shake hands with him. Right? So, Brahma did that. The beginning of creation. So, you can also do it. But, you have to wait. You have to follow the process. You cannot concoct. You cannot have your own method, invented method of trying to see God or trying to understand God. No, you have to follow the process. So, the process is given. It's all given in the scriptures and explained by the Acharya. So, you just follow that. It is guaranteed that you will be able to see God. You will take Realize in full. That's what Krishna tells Arjuna. Asamshayam samagram maam yathanyasasi tatshunu. He tells you hear from me how you can know me in full, free from doubt. So he tells Arjuna you hear. So our process is also hearing, hearing from. Krishna or Krishna's representative, Prabhupada. So that way, we can actually realize in full the personality of God Krishna, the absolute truth, free from all doubts. Okay, stop. Nantarashrima Bhagavatam Kita Shri Prabhupada.